Apart from the comment about sitting in an administrator's office, <laughs> I thought that was a great, great speech. Um, and we're very, very uh, just wonderful having Eric and, of course, the president as uh, part of our uh, sort of community and uh, Landy, whom I will hear from for just a second. But I think the, the thing that is so important is that we have these young people who join us every year and they look and see the people who are ahead of them. They see the integrity, the intelligence, the character, uh, and the, the service, the attitude that they bring to, uh, to these positions. And there's nothing that you can say uh, about an institution, uh, I think, that, that beyond what we do for young people. And these role models uh, are just uh, tremendous. Lanny Brewer, you're next. Uh, thank you, President Bollinger, for that kind introduction. It's really a great honor for me to be here with you all today and to see so many distinguished Columbia alumni. I have so many dear friends from Columbia who really remain so much a part of my life, both in D.C. and throughout the country. And for me, it's really an incredible honor to be here. It's remarkable to have so many D.C. area Columbia graduates in one place today. And I'm delighted to cap, as, uh, Dean, uh, as President Bollinger referred to it, to cap what has really been for me a Columbia-filled week with all of you. On Wednesday, coincidentally, I had the pleasure of being at Columbia on campus for a discussion with Dean Moody Adams in front of college and university students. And it was really, it was really terrific. The energy is just extraordinary. And Dean Moody Adams could not have been a more welcoming host. And I'm happy to know that she's our dean. I was really extremely taken with her strong rapport that she has clearly built with the students on campus over a very short period of time in her tenure. And I believe that she's a tremendous addition to the university, and I encourage all of you to meet her if you haven't yet. On the video we just all saw, Attorney General Holder praised President Bollinger's outstanding leadership. And I want to emphasize that as well. As an alumnus who has remained connected to the university, I've heard from many people over the years, and I've seen for myself what a phenomenal advocate for the university President Bollinger has been. From launching the largest capital campaign in the university's history, to initiating what may be the most ambitious expansion of the campus since President Lowe moved the university to Morningside Heights in 1897, to raising the overall global profile of this great university, President Bollinger has shown over the last nine years that Columbia is so very lucky to have him at the helm. Like many of you, I suspect, even though I live in D.C., I'm a New Yorker at heart. I was born in Manhattan at what was then called Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital, and I was raised in Queens, just like the Attorney General. Indeed, I grew up in Elmhurst, and he grew up in East Elmhurst. I went to Newtown High School in Elmhurst, Queens, and my mother still lives in Queens today. My story is similar to the stories of many New Yorkers from that time. My parents escaped to the United States from Europe, my mother from Germany and my father from Austria. My mother wasn't allowed to go to high school at home, and both my parents arrived in New York with not much more than a desire to have a better life in a new country that they hoped would treat them better than the ones they left. They met in Manhattan and eventually moved to Elmhurst, where my brother and I grew up. Even though Columbia was just a subway ride away from us, I didn't know much about it as a high school student. I knew that my smarter second cousin, Michael, from Washington Heights had gone there. <laughs> and I knew that Jewish mothers were happy when their sons got in. 
or their daughters got into Barnard. But I didn't have a clue, not a clue, about the world that Columbia would eventually open up to me, beginning, quite frankly, with my very first assignment in contemporary civilization, reading Plato's Republic. I certainly hadn't ever seen so many smart and intellectually engaged people together in one place. Columbia College then, like New York in some ways, was frankly not always the easiest place to be. Socially, the school didn't coddle anyone. And academically, it was more rigorous than anything I had personally known before. But also, like New York, Columbia moved me, as I imagine it moved you, to care about the world around me and to challenge myself to reach higher. Of course, not everyone believes that Columbia is the pinnacle of higher education. Theodore Roosevelt dropped out of the law school after one year. And he is quoted as saying, a man who has never gone to school may steal from a freight car. But if he has a university education, he may steal the whole railroad. <laughs> After two years as head of the criminal division, where we prosecute, among other things, where we prosecute sophisticated white collar crime, I can say that I believe TR may have something there. <laughs> Nevertheless, for me, after two years, two years of teaching high school abroad, I found myself back in Morningside Heights, this time at the law school. And unlike TR, I did graduate. Although I learned recently that FDR, like his cousin Teddy, also went to Columbia Law School and also left before graduating. Given that, I wouldn't blame any law students in the audience for thinking that you might have a better shot at becoming president of the United States if you drop out now. <laughs> and I guess I'd say that if you're Teddy Roosevelt or if you're FDR, you might be right. If you're anything like the rest of us, though, you probably ought to finish getting your degree. With that huge statue of Bellerophon taming Pegasus outside the law school, it was sometimes said when I was there at Columbia Law School that the law school was the only horse-drawn toaster in the world. <laughs> Not only was it a horse-drawn toaster because of the architecture, but also because people would say it popped in idealistic law students and three years later, Wall Street lawyers popped out. <laughs> Maybe there's a kernel of truth to that. But I didn't experience the law school in that way. The school I knew was a place where commitment to public service was an exceptionally important value, as the Attorney General just spoke about before, and where pursuing government work was strongly encouraged. Jerry Lynch, now a judge in the Second Circuit in the Court of Appeals in New York, and Mark Pomerantz, who had been the criminal chief as a, as a federal prosecutor in Manhattan, were young professors when I was a law student. And to this day, I remember them and Harold Rothwax, a professor of mine who was an esteemed state court judge, encouraging me in my choice to go to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office over a big firm. Now, I mentioned my brother, how we grew up in Elmhurst. And I have to say, probably the only good advice my older, older brother ever gave me was when I was debating between the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and a law firm. He said to me, you know, you've never had any money, so you won't know the difference. <laughs> but I knew the hard person to convince was my mother. Because my mother, of course, was that very prototypical immigrant who had worked hard, who had not been able to go to high school, and who had dreams for her son. And among those dreams, of course, was to be at a different economic level than we were. 
So being the young advocate that I thought I was, I called her up to tell her at my, after, uh, after I'd made my decision, I was a third year law student, that I wanted to go to the DA's office. So I called her at home and I said, Mom, I've made a decision. I'm gonna go to the Manhattan DA's office. I'm not gonna go to a firm. And Mom, just think about it. Andrew Cuomo, the son of the governor, he's in the Manhattan DA's office. Cyrus Vance, the son of the Secretary of State, he's in the DA's office. And Mom, Dan Rather Jr., and she loved Dan Rather on CBS. <laughs> He's at the DA's office. There was a long pause, and then I heard the following. Them, them, they should go to the DA's office. You, you should go to a firm. <laughs> well, I eventually won her over. I eventually would also at some point go to a firm, so it all worked. In any event, after four years in the district attorney's office and a lifetime in New York, I made my way, like all of you, to Washington, D.C. Some people say that Washington is a city of southern efficiency and northern charm. <laughs> but maybe because I'm from Queens, I actually think this city brims with charm and is full of nice people. Either way, whichever way you come out on that one, in preparing for today, I was surprised to learn that there are 10,000 Columbia alumni in the D.C. area. But as I reflected on the reasons why I came to Washington and the reasons I bet why so many Columbia graduates I know eventually settled here, it doesn't surprise me much at all. There is a deep tradition of public service at Columbia that runs back all the way to the revolutionary era. Columbia was founded and developed by American patriots like John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the United States, and Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury. Charles Evan Hughes and Harlan Fisk Stone, successful, successive Chief Justices of the Supreme Court, went to Columbia Law School, and they actually graduated, as did Benjamin Cardozo and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Dwight D. Eisenhower, of course, served as president of Columbia from 1948 until the time he became president of the United States in 1953. And of course, our current president, President Barack Obama, is class of 1983 from the college. And Attorney General Holder, as you know, graduated from both the college and the law school in the 70s. In short, public service at the highest levels of government is as much a part of the culture of Columbia as groundbreaking medical research or Nobel Prize winning economic theory. I wanna take this moment to say a word about the Attorney General whom I know you all were originally expecting to hear from today in person. He is a great patriot and a tremendous lawyer who, as President Bollinger said, has devoted his career to public service as a prosecutor, a judge, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, and now as our nation's 82nd Attorney General. He is also a real and dear friend and colleague. And it is a true honor for me to serve in the Justice Department under his leadership. He has succeeded in my view in restoring the, the department to its rightful place in American society, something about which I think all Americans can and should be very proud. And I personally have had no greater professional honor in my life than to lead the criminal division these past two years. Fighting the diverse threats we face requires vigilance and creativity. From widespread financial fraud to child pornography to Mexican drug cartel related violence to organized crime to foreign bribery and other forms of corruption we are up against very sophisticated foes. 
and the division's nearly 600 lawyers, together with U.S. attorney's offices around the country, are working hard to investigate and prosecute the full range of federal crimes. Starting with Attorney General Holder, the message to these prosecutors is clear. Our number one mission, number one, is to see that justice is done. Not that we win cases or make headlines, but that we live up to the ideal of Attorney General and later Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, who told a group of federal prosecutors in 1940, he said, a sensitiveness to fair play and sportsmanship is perhaps the best protection against a prosecutor's abuse of power. And the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who tempers zeal with human kindness, who seeks truth and not victims, who serves the law and not factional purposes, and who approaches his task with humility. These are incredibly important values for any prosecutor, and I'd like to think that all of our lawyers are striving to uphold them. At Columbia, among so many brilliant and accomplished people, one learns to approach lots of tasks with humility. It's an institution that attracts people from all over the world because among other things, big ideas are generated there in dozens and dozens of fields. It has a bold leader in President Bollinger who is cultivating what's best about the university while pursuing it toward new heights. Coming from where I did, Columbia meant the world to me, and it still does. It has been an honor to share this day with you. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Lenny, and I really mean it when I say that the sort of tone and the, the substance are all unified in, in making one very, very proud uh, about this leadership of what has to be uh, a core uh, of American society, and that is uh, justice and the rule of law, um, and, but also the sense of connection to Columbia that you express and have maintained uh, in your heart is, is really very meaningful to everyone here. Um, Lenny has agreed to take uh, a few questions, so uh, uh, that's great for us, and if anybody wants to ask a question, please uh, go to the microphone. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. So my name is Eddie Eiches, and I was going to ask you about the government shutdown and how it will affect justice and how it will affect others, and more, more as to that rather than the potential for settlement, because obviously we don't know whether that will happen. Well, I mean, we're all very, very hopeful that there will not be a government shutdown. Um, we're committed to continuing to support the people of the United States, and our prosecutors will be in court. Uh, we will continue to do the business of the court, but obviously it's a tremendous challenge, and we've all had to think through what would happen if that eventuality occurred. I'm very hopeful that'll be averted. I don't think that that would serve the American people. Hi there, Ms. Brewer. Thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, my name is Richard. I'm a student in the college. Uh, I'm leave to serve as an intern in the White House. So. Oh, great. I just wanted to, oh, and I guess a lot of the stuff we do there is cultivating young leadership, kind of cultivating young people to take on leadership roles. What would your greatest advice uh, be to, to young pe to students at the college uh, or you know, undergraduates in general to you know, pursue leadership opportunities in public service and really uh, contribute to society uh, through the opportunities at Columbia? And well, what I said the other day, and I guess my, my view in life and what I say to my own kids and really what I've tried to do for myself is, 
I've always tried to pursue what I thought would be fun. I think it's really hard to do well at anything if you don't get personal satisfaction and enjoyment in it. So my, my, my recommendation, and if you're interning at the White House, you'll see that the one unifying view in my, my perspective, and it certainly was what I took out of the Clinton White House when I was fortunate enough to work there, was you had people from diverse backgrounds, diverse interests, diverse skill sets, but the one common theme was they loved and had a passion for what they did. And I think if you have a love and a passion for what you do, then you can become and will become a leader because you'll just say it won't be artificial. It will generate a level of excitement and you'll want to do more. And so I know in this day and age, people are always trying to figure out what, with the economy and with other areas, what's, what's the best way to go. And maybe I'm wrong, but the advice I would give, since you asked me, is pursue what's in your heart and then you'll do well. And that's what I would do. Gregory Krasovsky, Columbia College, 91. Uh, on a personal level, I think I made a big mistake by choosing Penn Law School as opposed to Columbia Law School. <laughs> but they won me over with a scholarship. As the head of the criminal division of the U.S. Department of Justice, one of the things you face today is a very serious and unique situation where we have to deal with threats of terrorism and other things that threaten the security of our country. But at the same time, we know that our country, as uh, President Bolger has properly pointed out, was founded on principles of justice and liberty. And I think it was Benjamin Franklin, if I'm not mistaken, that said uh, people who are willing to sacrifice their liberties uh, for security will have neither. How do you make that fine balance, especially in prosecution of national security and terrorism-related cases? And how do you make those choices as a Columbia Law and a Columbia College graduate? As a lawyer, I've had experience of living and working in the former Soviet Union in Russia, and I've seen how prosecution of various cases can really curtail people's liberties, and you know, would certainly hate to see the U.S. go the same way, even to a tiny extent. Uh, so let me begin by saying, in, in all seriousness, I'm the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, and indeed, since 9/11 and the Patriot Act, there is now a a division, the National Security Division, and its focus is on terrorism. And so day to day, um, uh, there's an assistant attorney general who's remarkable who focuses on that. Look, uh, as the attorney general himself has said and has said repeatedly, the nation's security is the paramount and the number one priority for this administration and for this Department of Justice. Uh, we will remain uh, adamant and vigilant in, in doing that. Uh, there are different ways that that can be accomplished. Sometimes we will do it through civil courts. Sometimes if Congress and others tell us uh, we will do it through other means, whether it's through military tribunals and the like. Um, I think there are different ways to solve the nation's problems and to address the concerns. And I think the debate that's had is a debate that's sincerely held by well-meaning people. I don't think there's just one answer. What I think there is, though, is an absolute commitment by this department and this administration to hold those who would do harm to the United States accountable. We remain vigilant. The Attorney General stays up morning, noon, and night, and others of us do to support him. And so um, we will continue to do it. And in a mo moment of personal privilege, I see my friend for 35 years, and he was on my dorm, Carmen Hall, first year, right behind you, David Lay. Hi, David. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Philip Dolan. I'm a graduate of the college and the School of the Arts. Um, I wanted to ask a question. It concerns me that we have such a large prison population in the United States. Right. I think it's three million or something like that, and um, a lot of it is drug offenses. And I'm wondering if you could comment on sure. that. Sure. Absolutely. Well, I think it's a little over 2 million, and the federal population is about 225 or 230,000. Look, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's a real issue. This attorney general has said, and this administration has said, that we look and are very committed to a comprehensive approach to dealing with these kinds of issues. There's absolutely no question that there is a group of people who must be incarcerated, will be incarcerated, and we will continue to seek severe punishments for them. But there's also absolutely no question that we have to have retraining programs, rehabilitation programs, and manners of alternate sentencing for big groups of people. I'm a big believer in that. 
I was recently at a federal penitentiary, and, and it's really quite remarkable the skills that some of these uh, penitentiaries are able to uh, teach um, the, the inmates. And frankly, it's remarkable how dedicated and idealistic the people who work in the prisons are. And I really think sometimes those people are not given the credit that they are due. Uh, there's no question that's got to be a part of it. We can't continue to be incarcerating, you know, the kinds of numbers we are, and it's just going to have to be a balance. It's a comprehensive approach. It's a comprehensive approach that deals with the education of our children. It's a comprehensive approach about what our communities want to do with our children, and it's a comprehensive approach with what we're going to do once we incarcerate them. Um, there's no easy answers, but the Attorney General is a true leader in this area. We're focusing a lot on it and we'll continue to do so. Lenny, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you, President Bollinger. Thank you, Lanny Brewer. Um, I love the story about your mother. <laughs> I know she's proud. And also the words from Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson. Um, I, what President Bollinger said, uh, uh, something about pride, and that's exactly what I was sitting there thinking as I listened to Attorney General Holder uh, and to Assistant Attorney General Brewer, that how proud we all are of all of these people who are doing such important work uh, for our government, uh, for our country. So thank you very much. We're, so, we're fortunate today to have so many uh, leaders in the government who are, who are here with us who will be at lunch. Many of you who are leaders in many ways and doing outstanding things, I know there's going to be some great networking going on at lunch. Uh, we will all go out to the atrium. Staff will direct you to your tables. You're sitting at assigned tables, for the most part, based on the school from which you graduated. So if you will proceed to lunch, we will be back here starting promptly at 2 o'clock. So I'll see you at 1.58. I know you didn't pay attention to me the last time, but I'll see you at 1.58. Thank you. <laughs>